are Locked On Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Good evening to all the 12s out there. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Joining me as always, my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Glad to have you listening in to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. It's Matchup Wednesday. Going to be a bit more of a condensed Matchup Wednesday because just like the Seahawks, who have a shorter week to prepare for the 49ers, we have less airtime to cover this upcoming rematch at Lumen Field. But we'll be diving into several matchups to watch on Sunday, and we'll be answering your questions it is a rare Wednesday mailbag here on the Locked On Seahawks podcast. As always, we appreciate you making this podcast your first listen each and every day. Now for your lead story here on Locked On Seahawks. With Chris Carson and Rashad Penny currently nursing injuries, one of them being on injured reserve, the other one potentially heading that same path as we end to head towards the end of the season, the Seahawks are kicking the tires on one of the greatest running backs to ever play the game. Adrian Peterson today agreeing to terms to join Seattle's practice squad. Rob, this was kind of a move that came out of left field. I don't think anybody anticipated that Seattle was going to be bringing Peterson in for a visit today, let alone quickly signing into the practice squad with a chance that he might be active for their game coming up against the 49ers on Sunday. It's only been one week since Peterson was waived by the Tennessee Titans. He played three games there, had a couple starts, 82 rushing yards on 27 attempts and a touchdown. Not great numbers by any means, but certainly a player that, as he has aged into his mid-30s, has up to this point at least been a productive enough backup in the league. Oh, he has. And I watched uh, a lot of Adrian Peterson's runs in Tennessee, and and I still think that he does have some, some juice and some explosiveness in those legs. Now, he is not the player that he once was. He's 36 years old. Uh, but at the same time, I, I also think that for a team that I think, whether they want to admit it or not, I think that they have to look at themselves in the mirror and question whether all of their players are going to continue to compete. Adrian Peterson plays the game like Frank Gore plays the game because he loves to play the game. Uh, and, and so for when you have a guy who is a first ballot Hall of Famer, um, and yet still wants to continue playing, I think that that can rub off on people. I think that, that Pete Carroll has been as enamored with Adrian Peterson and other athletes who just are unbelievable, even in comparison to other professional athletes. Then I think that, again, I think that it makes some sense for uh, for teams to bring in players like an Adrian Peterson, even at this later stage of their career, because they can be that locker room leader that's looking for. When everybody else is looking to quit, this guy wants to play a little bit. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why that, that Seattle might be looking to do it. We, you and I had a conversation yesterday, of course, about how, how Seattle might be looking to get some of their younger players onto the field to just be able to evaluate who they are. But that's not the Pete Carroll way. He wants to play his best guys right now. And to me, this is the, the biggest news of this is not the fact that the Seahawks signed Adrian Peterson. It's the fact that the Seahawks apparently don't have a great deal of faith in some of the young running backs that they have on their roster. And obviously, given the, the, the draft pick that they used on Rashad Penny and how that's not turned out, um, you know, and the fact that they have a couple of undrafted uh, free agent running backs that are on their practice squad or on their roster and they have not given them actual opportunities in games. To me, that's the bigger story here it is Seattle obviously feels that running back is a huge position of concern. Yeah, that was the first thing that when I saw this news break today that Peterson was in Seattle, that's the first thing that jumped out to me. You know, yes, they've got a number of players that are injured. Travis Homer is still dealing with a calf issue as well there's a chance that he's going to be ready to play on Sunday and that would help matters. But you're talking about having Carson, Penny, potentially Homer all being sidelined. So they are very shorthanded the position. And Alex Collins, he's been dealing with a groin issue for more than a month and that's limited his effectiveness and how much they can use him. So I understand the body situation. They needed insurance, but it seems a little weird that they wouldn't just elevate Josh Johnson, their undrafted rookie out of Louisiana Monroe up to the active roster. And like you said, maybe that just suggests they don't feel like he's ready or they haven't been as impressed as maybe Pete Carroll has tried to lead on in his press conferences 
with the young back. DJ Dallas, maybe they have not felt as pleased with what they have seen in the field, his pass protection gap that he made the other day, for example. Those are things you can't do if you want to play. So that might be the biggest part of this, is that they know Adrian Peterson is a proven veteran that is going to be go able to go out there and do what the Seahawks ask of him. Now, he's never been known for his pass protection and receiving skills. He can catch the football, okay, but that's never been his game. Even in his prime, he was a first and second down battering ram back. We're going to feed you 25, 30 times. He's going to rush for 1,500-plus yards year in, year out, and he's going to be an all-pro candidate. That's the kind of back that Adrian Peterson was. He wasn't known for being a third-down back that did a lot of those other things especially well. He didn't need to because of how dominant he was in the run game. From a physical standpoint, the explosiveness at 36 years of age, I, he's surprisingly explosive for his age, but he obviously is not the athlete that he used to be. I think that probably what jumps out to Pete Carroll right now, what they've missed most from Chris Carson being out, that between the tackles runner that just brings an edge and brings tenacity and is difficult to bring down. Adrian Peterson still has those qualities. He doesn't have the ability to make guys miss in the hole like he might have been able to do even three or four years ago, but he can still get downhill and he can still bring it physically. And so maybe Pete Carroll's looking at this like, hey, even if he's only able to give us a few games here, if he can give us eight to 10 carries and just give us some semblance of a between the tackles run game, that could be a huge difference for the rest of our offense. So that's looking at the brightest side here. This could also be a case where they haven't practiced a few days and they're like, look, it this didn't work out. It doesn't look like there's much in the tank and they might not even elevate him for this next game. So there's a number of different things that could happen here, but initially I was really surprised and a little bit baffled by this move, but now looking at it, he's on the practice squad you're not losing anything by having him there. And if he gives you some decent carries, that's something they haven't had in the run game for weeks. So it could end up being a little bit of a win for them if he's still got enough juice to give him a few carries here down the stretch and maybe can help him win a few football games. Yeah, that's the way I look at it as well, is that especially when you look at this uh, upcoming opponent, San Francisco 49ers, which we're going to be doing here in just a moment, um, you know, they are really hurrying at the linebacker position. And so to me, this is a, a signing that, that indicates that Seattle is going to try to run the football right down their opponent's throat. That's something that they've talked about doing, of course, all season long. Maybe this is a little bit of a sign that they actually will follow through with their, their promises. Yeah, but if it doesn't work out, if it's if it's a situation where Peterson isn't able to get up to speed or he just doesn't have anything left in the tank and they lose another game or two, then to me at that point, there's no reason to be giving reps to a 36-year-old running back. Let the young guys go. So this also seems like to me it, it's another move that indicates that Pete Carroll said this to me today. I asked him about playing younger players because of their lack of – success this year and almost being eliminated from the playoffs and he didn't sound keen on that idea I'm not just going to play young guys to play young guys he wants to win you got to wonder if that mindset starts to change a little bit towards playing more young guys if they lose another game or two and they might not give those reps to Adrian Peterson so like I said it was a little bit of a baffling move but stepping back I can see what the Seahawks are trying to do and it's not like they're paying him a ton of money he's on the practice squad so really, nothing to lose. See if he's got something he can provide your run game, and you get some decent carries from him. That's a win because their run game has been near non-existent the last few games. We're going to get into our matchups here in a little bit, but first, we're going to answer your mailbag questions here. Normally on Monday, we tackle our mailbag, doing it here this week and a shortened week on Wednesday. Make sure to check out Bet Online. They've got you covered all season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football season continues to march towards the playoffs, Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. So make sure to head to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Use the promo code LOCKED ON to receive your bonus. Whether it's basketball, football, NHL, boxing, or UFC, all the way to your Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. So let's dive into our mailbag here now, Rob. Again, normally we do this on Monday. The Seahawks had a game Monday, kind of changed up our schedule a little bit this week. But as promised, going to get your questions in on today's show. So we're going to start off with this first one for you, Rob, coming from Pratik. Tweets, 
Why was Carlos Dunlap only on the field for four snaps on Monday? He's our top paid defensive lineman, more or less, and it felt like he was a healthy scratch. How did we get to this point? <laughs> well, how did we get to this point? Is That's a whole different question. I mean, obviously, the Seahawks are where they are in terms of record. Um, we just talked about that. It, it is a little bit confusing when you, you see Seattle uh, you know, sign a, a 36-year-old running back and yet the, the the 30-something plus defensive end who helped key their biggest uh, turnaround in franchise history on the defensive side of the ball just a season ago, and now he's not getting any kind of playing time. But I would again argue that it, a lot of this comes down to the specific matchups against it. Just the way that a downhill running back would make sense going up against a defense that is lacking at linebacker against the San Francisco 49ers this week. Against the, the Washington football team a week ago, with Taylor Heineke getting the ball out of his hands as quickly as he does, I think that it meant for Seattle to feature their quicker pass rushers, regardless of their age. And their quicker pass rushers are clearly guys like Alton Robinson, a Daryl Taylor, a Rasheem Green, a Benson Mayoa. Now, they weren't particularly effective either. Um, and, and frankly, Carlos Dunlap, I think, has to be better than he has been. But from a schematic standpoint, from a talent standpoint, I think that it did make some sense that Dunlap was not on the field as much just four snaps i thought that he certainly should have been on the field that uh, a lot more than that considering how much washington held the football last week i think it's performance based more than anything he just hasn't been good this year that's yeah. the reality half a sack he just he's been a non-factor rushing the passer and i think p carroll can say what he wants to say about not wanting to play young guys unless they've absolutely earned it or whatever but I do think that that was a sign they are going to be phasing some of these younger players in. And some of it might have been schematic. But at this point, he just hasn't done enough. They're trying to find a spark at defensive end, and he hasn't provided that this year. Next question coming from Matthew Laub tweets, what position on offense do we need to improve the most coming into next season? And same on defense. Well, obviously, this is a flexible question depending on some of the moves the Seahawks make before free agency starts. But as of right now on offense, it is blatantly obvious to me. It's the same position that was the biggest position of need last year. The Kyle Fuller, Ethan Posick era has failed. Those two should not have been your fallback options at center. As a backup, either one of them might have been fine. But they did not upgrade that position. It was the biggest mistake that they have made on offense. It's come back to bite them this season. They have to find an upgrade to the center position, either through the draft or in free agency. They got to find somebody because the long term answer is not currently on this roster. And on defense, I think it's the pass rush again. I just mentioned Carlos Dunlap not producing. You're not getting much from Benson Mayoa. Alton Robinson has been hit and miss, not enough opportunities necessarily. Daryl Taylor's been the one consistent source of pass rush that they've had on this team. They've got to find somebody else that can pin their ears back and consistently turn up the heat and finish sacks. That's been another big issue, getting in the backfield but not finishing. They need to upgrade the pass rush. It feels like a broken record. I thought they were going to be better this year in that regard. It has not panned out. They're one of the worst teams in the league getting sacks. A big part of that the edge rush just simply has not met expectations for this football team. Hawkstrologer tweets, what are the chances the Seahawks start Geno Smith versus the 49ers or bench Russell Wilson if bad stuff continues in the beginning of the game? What do you think, Rob? Is there any chance that we see Geno Smith on Sunday? I think there's no chance unless Russell Wilson gets some kind of other injury. Um, you know, I, I just think that it's very unlikely that Seattle would do so. Um, now, I think that they perhaps should, as I've talked about here for the last three weeks in a row now, ever since that Green Bay Packers, uh, you know, loss where it was just very, very clear to me that Russell Wilson was not ready to play. And I've seen no evidence yet that he has the accuracy that the quarterback needs to be successful in today's NFL. But do I think that the Seahawks are going to be willing to actually tell their franchise quarterback, sorry, you got to sit down. We're going to play the, the career back up ahead of you. No, I don't think there's any chance that that's going to happen. No, Pete Carroll said today, somebody was asking, does Russell Wilson need a rest? And he said, no, absolutely not. He doesn't need a rest. They are not going to be benching him. Even if he continues to play poorly, I think it would take an injury again to Russell Wilson for Geno Smith to get out there. They're going to ride with their franchise quarterback. 
Next question coming from Joey Easterbrook. Has Russell Wilson's performance this season impacted his trade value? I, I don't really think so. I think if the Seahawks were going to move Russell Wilson, I think there are a lot of teams out there that are desperate for a franchise quarterback that are going to believe he just needs a change of scenery. There's been a lot of drama there. It was just a rough season all around for the Seahawks. Let's get him to a new team. Let's get him hooked up with a new coordinator, a new coach. And we think that he can return to his former All-Pro Pro Bowl form. So I think that, you know, maybe it impacts how many first-rounders they can get. But, but I still would think if the Seahawks want to explore trading him, that teams like the Giants are going to be jumping at the bit to give three draft picks, three first-rounders away. And they got two of them this year. They, they might be willing to trade those three and maybe some players or later picks on top of it. That's how badly the Giants would love to have a player like Russell Wilson. So no, I, I don't think the struggles this year, the injury or anything, I don't think that's going to impact the market if he truly becomes available. That remains to be seen. Steve tweets, who would you consider quality head coaching candidates to replace Pete Carroll? I answered a question similar to this a few weeks ago, but you were not on the show with me, Rob. So let's get some input from you on some potential head coaching options. If somehow Pete Carroll resigns, retires, or gets fired after this debacle of a season? You know, I, I think that's easy to always say, guys, who were head coaches previously, um, you know, and, and some people like to say, oh, that's a retread. And and I think that that just means that they have some experience. Uh, Pete Carroll was a retread. Uh, Bill Belichick was a retread. Bill Parcells was a retread, uh, you know, so to me, these are guys that uh, because they had some experience and because they had some wins, then um, again, I think that just makes them that much more effective, um, you know, so I, I mentioned one guy that I think deserves a lot of attention um, and that's Josh McDaniels in New England. I have been so impressed with what he has been able to do with the young quarterback, Mac Jones, um, that I think that, that he does deserve. Um, you know, a, a second opportunity, should he want it? Now, is he a fit in Seattle? That I don't know. But I, I do think that that he should be getting uh, bandied about as very much as, as much as, you know, some of the other hot names out there um, in, in the NFL right now with some of the assistant coaches. Brian Dable of, of Buffalo would be another one um, that is, again, from an offensive perspective, I think makes some sense. Um, let, let me mention a guy from the, the collegiate ranks. Uh, and I think Mario Cristobal. At the University of Oregon is a fantastic coach. I've had an opportunity to speak with him a couple of different times. Um, I work with the Morris Trophy and the fact that they've had multiple winners. Um, and, and Mario Cristobal has that it factor. Um, there's a lot of University of Washington fans who don't want to hear that, or maybe they do because maybe they want him out of Eugene. But uh, Mario Cristobal, I think if he wants to be in the NFL, um, then I, I think that he would be successful as well. And then one other guy that just kind of popped in the top of my head, because again, going back to the coordinator standpoint and the experience, I was really impressed by what the Washington football team was able to do a week ago. And Scott Turner, the, the son of Norv Turner, of course, longtime NFL coordinator, as well as head coach. Again, I've just been very impressed. By, by what he's been able to do. To me, th there's a lot of teams out there, a lot of guys out there who will say, you know, go for a guy like Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator in Kansas City. Well, Kansas City is absolutely loaded with talent. Their, their offense should be humming, considering all of the different players they have. Show me the coach who doesn't have a great deal of talent and yet still wins, still produces a great, uh, you know, great deal of success. So those are some of the players, some of the coaches that haven't had a great deal of offensive talent uh, around them and yet still have been successful. Um, so those are a couple of the guys that really jump out to me right off the top of my head. I mentioned Dable when I was asked this question a few weeks ago. To me, he would be my number one candidate because of what he's done with Josh Allen. And that would be assuming you're going to keep Russell Wilson. I would love to see that pairing if they were to move on from Pete Carroll or he retired. At the college ranks, one coach that I did not mention any college coaches, but I really like Campbell at Iowa State. And I would be intrigued by him as an NFL head coach. And I think Seattle might actually be a good fit for him. Now, again, this is getting way ahead of ourselves. We don't know that anything is happening with Pete Carroll, but that would be the one college coach that I would maybe have some interest in. And there's a couple offensive coordinators with Dable being a headliner. And Patrick Graham, the defensive coordinator for the Giants, I'm also very impressed by him. And I think he's got a future being a quality NFL head coach in this league as well. Last question coming from Mitchell. Do you think our running woes are a result of poor plays to the running backs 
or losing the battle up front in the trenches. I think it's a little bit of both, but if you're looking at this last game, it was 95% the trenches, not having Damian Lewis and having Kyle Fuller in at left guard. I think that Fuller's given everything he's got. It's just he is not an NFL guard. He can't move people off the ball, struggled in pass protection. He was playing next to Ethan Posick, who's not necessarily a baller either. They just couldn't establish the line of scrimmage. The running backs, they had multiple defenders in the backfield almost every time they were touching the ball. It just wasn't a day that they were going to be able to run the ball at all, regardless of the plays that they were calling. The line did not get the job done. I think there have been times early this year, even Alex Collins at times has missed some holes because his vision has betrayed him a little bit. They've had their struggles in terms of getting their running backs rolling because of injuries. So I think it's a little bit of everything, but the line this past week was a much bigger part of that. And I think for the most part, that has been the bigger issue than the running backs they have in the backfield. The line just hasn't played as well in the run game, being able to establish the line of scrimmage and win at the point of attack as I think Pete Carroll, Mike Solari, and Shane Waldron were hoping they would going into this season. Let's get to the matchups here, but first, Let's talk Built Bar. This holiday season, grab the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar or even better than a candy bar, filled with so much holiday goodness, rich and decadent flavor covered in chocolate, amazingly low in calories, sugar, carbs, and fat, and also high in protein. So you're getting the best of both worlds. And there's so many delicious flavors, whether it's mint brownie, cherry, double chocolate, cookies and cream, my favorite peanut butter brownie. It gives you the extra fuel you need to bust down those mall doors and battle all the holiday shoppers this December. Or if you're just standing at endless shopping lines, Built Bar can give you just a little something extra to keep you going because it's the season of peace and love. Don't bring up your favorite Built Bar flavor at family parties. People are so passionate about their favorite flavor, they'll fight for it. Trust me, my family is going to be fighting over the peanut butter brownies that I'm bringing for Christmas. Things are going to get out of hand. If you're friends with Santa, make sure to tell Santa to throw a few Built Bars in those stockings as well. Want to cozy up with something warm? Here's a holiday secret. Dip your Built Bar into piping hot cup of cho hot chocolate. It is fantastic. I'm telling you, I've done it three or four times. It's delicious. Let it melt a little. Give your beverage a bit of that Built Bar flavor. Like some of those marshmallowy treats around the holidays, you need to get your hands on Built Bar puffs as well. Light, fluffy, marshmallowy through and through, different flavors all covered in chocolate, taste so good you won't believe they're filled with protein. Make sure to go to Built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15 and you can get 15% off your order this holiday season. Let's talk matchups, Rob. We've got the Seahawks and 49ers, two bitter rivals that are going in opposite directions. The 49ers were playing poorly for a good chunk of the first part of the season, but they've now won three straight. They're above 500. They are right in the thick of things in the wild card race. In fact, right now, they're the number six seed in the NFC. So things have changed while the Seahawks have continued their nosedive to three and eight. But the Seahawks did win the first time these teams got together back in week four in Santa Clara. Seattle's going to be looking for the season sweep during a year where very little else has gone right. Let's start when the Seahawks are on offense. Obviously, we're familiar with these two teams they play each other all the time. They've already had one matchup this year. What is one matchup when the Seahawks are on offense and the 49ers are on defense that you are going to be watching very closely heading into this rematch? Well, I think that considering that the, the 49ers are not going to have the, their superstar linebacker Fred Warner, um, they're also not going to have their superstar wide receiver slash running back in Debo Samuel, then to me, there is really only one matchup that you have to look for, and that is how are the Seahawks going to be able to slow down Nick Bosa? Um, of course, most of the time, that's going to come off the left side where you feel like you have their your, your best offensive lineman, Dwayne Brown. Um, there's other times where San Francisco moves him on to the other side. So you go up against Brandon Shell, who I think has played solidly. Um, but at the same time, to me, slowing down Nick Bosa, by extension, slowing down guys like Samson Ibukam, uh, a little tip of the cap there, former Eastern Washington grad. Um, but but slowing down Nick Bosa, I think, has to be priority number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way all all the way up. Yeah, he's got 11 sacks this year. He's really come on strong as of late. And they don't have a lot of other weapons with that pass rush now. It's a different situation that has been in the past couple of years where they have been loaded depth-wise with pass rushers at defensive end. They don't have that luxury now, but Bosa has still been able to get into the backfield consistently wreak havoc. He's fully recovered from 
missing most of last season with a torn ACL. So trying to keep him out of the backfield is going to be really key for the Seahawks. And another matchup that I think bears notice in this game, you mentioned Fred Warner being injured. He's not expected to play this week. That is a huge loss in the middle of San Francisco's defense. Dre Greenlaw, another one of their linebackers, is also expected to be out. So this is a team that right now, this is their depth chart at linebacker. Aziz al Demetrius Flanagan-Fowles, and Marcel Harris. That is the three linebackers expected to play extensive snaps for the 49ers on Sunday. al Shaher gave up 96 yards in coverage on Sunday against the Minnesota Vikings. So you can beat him with the passing game. He's had his issues at times with the run game. Not a bad football player, but when he's your best linebacker on the field and you've got unproven players next to him, Marcel Harris was a safety when he first came into the league. So maybe he's going to have some advantages in coverage for that reason. But this just feels like a group that Alex Collins, DJ Dallas, Adrian Peterson, he gets called up for this game. And the tight ends as well, Gerald Everett and Colby Parkinson, those guys that are athletes that can win in space as receivers going up against these linebackers with Fred Warner not being out there, Dre Greenlaw not being out there. This is a game that I think the Seahawks, if they can get to the second level with their running backs, they can have some success against these linebackers. And in the passing game, if you're Shane Waldron and you're scheming things up, I am attacking these linebackers with my tight ends and my running backs in the passing game. Get the ball out of Russell Wilson's hands quickly. That negates Nick Bosa off the edge, and it allows you to hopefully sustain some drives, something they have struggled with all year long. I think a big key to that, getting your running backs and your tight ends involved in the passing game. Take advantage of the linebackers that the 49ers have out in the field, the injuries they've got there. Every offensive coordinator has got to be able to find the rat on defense I feel like in this case, the Rats right now are at linebacker without having your superstar Fred Warner there. You know, I 100% agree with you. I think that Seattle did some right things on offense a week ago, and even though it was a disappointing loss to Washington. I mean, DJ Dallas actually led Seattle with five receptions, and I think that that's got to be some of the strategy this week as well. Um, not necessarily specifically to Dallas, but just throwing the ball to the running back. Um, you know, and, and so I think that that's going to be something that, that they do. You, you mentioned the tight ends. I, I love the matchup of Seattle's tight ends um, against this uh, inexperienced linebacking core um, for San Francisco. Um, and, and then I think that, uh, you know, of course, you always got to focus in on, on Seattle's dynamic wide receivers. Uh, you know, when, when DK Metcalf had a touchdown the last time these two teams played, um, you know, I, I've said over and over again, I mean, what a, what a physical marvel that he is. Um, so to me, he needs to be a focal point and early get him mentally and in, in emotionally involved in this in this football game very early on to kind of reassure him after basically being blanked a, a week ago. The, the San Francisco 49ers have solid cornerbacks. Uh, Josh Norman is not the athlete that he once was, although he is very good at forcing fumbles. And so that's one of the things that you have to kind of be careful for is, is that once Seattle's wide receivers get the ball in their hands, they have to keep the ball in their hands. To me, this is a game that you can win Seattle, um, you know, and, and so if the, one of the ways to, to screw that up, though, of course, is to create some kind of easy turnover opportunities, uh, considering that Russell Wilson has not, for all of his negatives all so far this season, he has not thrown a lot of interceptions, but fumbles have continue to be an issue for this club. Let's look at when the 49ers are on offense going up against a Seahawks defense that we talked about yesterday. They've been playing really good football for more than a month, and they continue that on Monday, again, in a losing effort, only giving up 17 points. They aren't going to have to worry about Debo Samuel, who's truly turned into the NFL's most dynamic Swiss Army knife. He looks like a bell cow running back when they give him the ball out of the backfield even with eye formation they can do everything with it a great receiver with over a thousand receiving yards this year but he's not going to play this week he's got an injury so that is certainly advantageous for the Seahawks but the matchup that really concerns me since that week four game San Francisco over the past few weeks they have really got their run game going rookie Elijah Mitchell a player that you and I talked about a lot going into the pre-draft process I thought he might be a player that interested Seattle late in the draft but with only three picks that was probably not going to happen 49ers ended up getting him he's a physical runner for his size and he's got 400 plus yard games this year as a rookie for the 49ers so he's found his groove on the ground They've also got Jeff Wilson back from injury. He's given the Seahawks some problems in the past. And, of course, Kyle Juszczyk, the best fullback in the NFL, 
that can do damage as a receiver and a runner. He can block really well. They can move him all over the formation. I'd be concerned about their ability to get that downhill running game going and, of course, off tackle, that outside zone that they're so known for. And I would also worry about the screen game, not just to your tailbacks, but also to Kyle Juszczyk, who's very effective on screens. They might even mix in a few for their tight ends as well. Kyle Shanahan's a master at that, and Seattle has struggled with that. So linebackers, I'm looking at you again. This is something they improved upon last week in Washington. Can they continue to defend screens better than they did for most of the early portion of the season? If they can do that and they can contain the run game, you put the ball in Jimmy Garoppolo's court, especially without his best receiver, I still think that this is a game the Seahawks can win if they can take away those key parts, those key elements of what the 49ers want to do offensively. Yeah, but that's, of course, a big, huge if. Um, you know, because considering how much the Seattle has been victimized by opposing running backs so far this season, and we've talked over and over again, Corbin, about how well that, uh, you know, that the Kyle Shanahan has been able to basically find just about any back that he wants and, and still be able to run for 100 yards. So I would agree. I think that that is a critical matchup from Seattle's perspective. But to me, because Debo Samuel is is not going to play in this game, then all of your pass your your secondary has to shift its attention to stopping George Kittle. And and I I love love the matchup between Jamal Adams and George. These are two of the more physical uh, and physical players in, in at their respective positions in all of the NFL. So to me, this is the matchup that I'm looking forward to watching. I do think that both players are going to get the better of their opponent at times. But to me, this is that kind of tip for tap, uh, uh, you know, punch counter punch kind of matchup that makes it so much fun to watch. Yeah, that's going to be my favorite matchup to watch from a one-on-one -on -one standpoint. And this is why John Schneider said they traded for Jamal Adams to begin with. It was this matchup, having to defend George Kittle. And I thought he did a pretty good job against him in the first matchup. Now, Kittle was just coming back from an injury, was not close to 100%. So that's something worth noting here. There was also a play, it was a double pass, that if the initial pass back to Jimmy Garoppolo would have been better, I think that we probably would see George Kittle in the end zone of that play. But the pass back to him ended up being kind of poor, and that threw off the entire play. It gave Adams a chance to get back there and make up pass breakup. And force the third down so they got to hope that they can find a way to slow him down he only had one catch last week but he's had some big games against him in the past I would think with Samuel being out he and Brandon Ayuk are going to be the top targets in this game for Jimmy Garoppolo a lot of that's going to fall on Jamal Adams can you get the job done in coverage that's what we brought you in for is this matchup to handle big tight ends like this they had their trouble with Zach Ertz a few weeks ago you got to hope that they do a better job in this game because Kittle's one of those players that can take over football games in the tight end position once he gets going. And this is an offense for San Francisco that has really been humming the last three or four games. They've figured things out since the Cardinals beat them, and they're just playing really good, sound, fundamental football right now. So going to be a tough opponent. Going to have a chance to look even further at this tomorrow with the Locked On 49ers crew, Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker. Looking forward to breaking down this rematch further heading into Sunday's contest at Lumen Field. Thanks for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen every day. Now make your second listen Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang, and you can check out the Locked On Seahawks podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and the new Odyssey app. That's AUD. ACY. You won't want to miss tomorrow's episode. Again, going to be hooking up with the Locked On 49ers crew for our weekly crossover episode. Going to be a blast kicking it with those guys and breaking down this upcoming match between bitter rivals. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Go Hawks.